Ontario invests in affordable housing in Thunder Bay. Area hunters speak out against Canada's gun control bill. And the premiers demand more health care funding from Ottawa. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Ford government is working with Delico and Matawa to bring 16 new affordable housing units to Thunder Bay. MPP Kevin Holland joined officials from both organizations today to announce funding for two separate projects. One of them includes funding from the DSAB for transitional housing for people struggling with addiction and homelessness. Riley, Riley McManus reports. That's why I'm very pleased to announce that we are investing nearly $1.7 million through the Social Services Relief Fund in two project, these two projects to create 16 housing, housing units in the Thunder Bay area. That provincial money from the Social Services Relief Fund will help two projects in the Thunder Bay area. Delico Anishinaabek Family Care will get nearly $800,000 in total from the province and the DSAB to create 10 transitional housing units at the old Heath Park School in Westford. The clients will also receive additional support for addiction treatment and substance use. Assistant Director Christine Stasiuk details how their housing units will work. Everything that or anything that the youth identifies a need, we can 100% put in because we have it all. We have we have aftercare, wellness, sobriety. We have um, clinical services like psychiatry to help with ODSP or DSO. So we have everything to wrap around while they do live in a safe, supportive housing environment. Matawa's non-profit housing corporation, which also partners with Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services, will create six housing units at this empty lot on McLaughlin Street for couples or smaller families in Thunder Bay who identify as Indigenous, Métis or Inuit. Matawa CEO David Paul Achni Pineskum says it's been almost 10 years since they acquired that property and finally have it zoned for this purpose. The six unit that uh, we're building it so uh, we have been, you know, actually uh, looking at this for a long time now. And we're finally glad to see this happen. Uh, three units are going to be for there, pretty well on a floor level. But we also have three units that are going to be accessible to people that have mobility uh, limitations. And that's what we're very happy about. MPP Kevin Holland says in order for the government to deal with homelessness, mental health and addictions problems in our community, having projects like these are extremely important. Projects like these and fundings like the one we announced today is a good step in, in creating that housing that's required for a more vulnerable in our community. So it's, it's a really great, great news item for us. Over the last four years, we've invested over $11 million to, through Thunder Bay Social Services Administration Board. So, um, you know, there's a real commitment to, to tackle the issues that we have in Thunder Bay. The goal is to have the units completed by March 2023. Riley McManus, TBT News. A pair of Thunder Bay murder suspects appeared in court today, one to hear sentencing submissions for how long he could be sent to prison, and the other to hear his verdict. 29-year-old Peter Kiash was charged with uttering death threats, forcible confinement, and second-degree murder in October of 2018, following the stabbing death of 32-year-old Irene Barkman at a Dufferin Street residence. Today, a judge found Kiash guilty of all charges. He'll be sentenced next year. Meanwhile, another judge heard sentencing submissions for 26-year-old Jonathan Yellowhead, who was found guilty of manslaughter back in August. 17-year-old Braden Jacob was found dead at Chapels Park in December of 2018. The Crown wants 10 years in jail, while Yellowhead's lawyer is asking for 3 to 5. A decision will be made early next year. The full stories on both cases can be found at tbnewswatch.com. The Trudeau Liberals' amendments to Bill C-21 have gun users across Canada and here in the Northwest up in arms. They claim it unfairly targets law-abiding sports shooters, hunters and farmers. The head of the Northwestern Ontario Sportsmen's Alliance is now lobbying the two local Liberal MPs who insist that's not the goal of the bill. Vasilios Bellows reports. Look behind me at these firearms here on the rack and the people that are in this store shopping they're not the people that are on the streets threatening violence. 
They just want to go hunting. Amendments to the Liberals' Bill C-21 has sparked both controversy and confusion over the past few days, with some sports shooters and hunters disagreeing with the weapons being targeted. The proposed ban on certain semi-automatic rifles often used for hunting is what has many gun users concerned, including NASA Executive Director John Kaplanis. And while the Liberals are marketing C-21 as a way of enhancing public safety, Kaplanis says it's only hurting law-abiding gun owners. Criminals don't care. They're, they're not going to follow any of these laws. They're not following them now. So we see the, these measures as, as uh, wrongly targeting hunters. Uh, they do not do anything to target crime on the streets. So that will continue. It's not hunters and trappers and farmers that are doing it. That's the reality. Bill C-21 focuses on a regulatory ban on what are being called assault-style weapons, though the government has yet to nail down a definition for this. Local MP Patty Haidu says that's part of this process and that the Liberals are talking to gun users to ensure the correct weapons are eventually banned. Make sure that we're consulting with hunters, that we don't end up with uh, commonly used uh, guns that are, 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 you know, necessity tools that are, that are um, not accessible in any other way or, you know, that prevent the tradition of hunting. We want to make sure that people obviously uh, can, can continue. And in Indigenous rights, there's a, there's a, there's a treaty right to hunting. Thunder Bay's other MP, Marcus Pulowski, calls the issue of banning firearms highly complex and difficult to find a middle ground where all groups are satisfied. Pulowski says his government's amendments were not perfect and that it's time to go back to the drawing board. For some people who want to politicize this, they say it's an attack on hunters. It certainly wasn't intended to be an attack on hunters. Now, did we, we, did we get the line right? No, I don't think we did. I think there's a recognition that we didn't, and that's why it's being um, reopened and we're relooking at it again. Bill C-21 is currently at the committee stage, where it will be studied by a small group of parliamentarians who will also hear from interested individuals or groups. Vasilio Bellows, TBT News. OPP and Sioux Lookout have announced a major drug bust valued at nearly half a million dollars. On Wednesday, the OPP Street Crime Unit and NAPS executed a search warrant at a residence on King Street in Sioux Lookout. Officers seized a large quantity of cocaine, meth and oxycodone with a street value of about $450,000. Cash and stolen items were also recovered. Two Sioux Lookout women aged 33 and 29 now face trafficking charges. Planning continued this week for a long-awaited access road to Martin Falls First Nation. The consultation, or the consultants rather, in charge of the project held a pair of public input sessions and also provided an update on when things will move to the next stage. Jonathan Wilson has the details. Public forums were held both in Geraldton and here at the Norwester Hotel in Thunder Bay to show the latest information panels for the proposed Martin Falls all-season community access road. Project officials are hearing a mix of feedback, but community lead Bob Baxter says most residents of his fly-in community feel the benefits outweigh the downsides. There's always mixed feelings. Some, uh, some people want it and some people don't, but the majority, from, uh, from as far as I can remember, wanted uh, a road access to the community so that uh, they could be free to travel, for one thing, you know, go out of the community anytime they want. Plus, uh, it would uh, lower the cost of... Uh, of food, fuel. Yeah, there's a lot of excitement with community members on uh, Martin Falls, community members on the road. Kazim Sadiq is the principal consultant with Suslop, the consulting firm carrying out the environmental assessment for the project. He says they're working towards a preferred alternative for the gravel road, which would run about 200 kilometers from Painter Lake Road over several rivers and ending up at Martin Falls. Some sections of the two options overlap, while other portions veer to the east or west. So right now, we're really trying to make a decision on the two alternatives that we have, which one is the preferred, and that's only possible by getting information from neighboring communities, getting indigenous knowledge. You know, we got burial grounds along the rivers and uh, spiritual sites and uh, hunting sites and stuff like that, so we know all that. Under the current timeline, the preferred route alternative will be announced in 2023, followed by the review of the draft EA in 2024. The final EA will then be reviewed in 2025, which, if approved by the federal and provincial governments, would allow the project to move to the construction phase. The estimated price tag has not yet been determined.
At the preliminary engineering stage, we, we don't have an estimate for the cost of this road at this point. So not even a ballpark price tag? 100 million, 200 million, 500 million? You know, anything I put out there is right now such a guess. Uh, there's so much work that's required on the engineering side of things and our alternatives are so different. Baxter says the road will provide benefits for generations of Martin Falls members, but it will take time. According to the proposed terms of reference, the construction phase could take anywhere from three to ten years. Well, I hope I see it in my time. <laughs> Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. The fourth annual Novemberger campaign was another big and tasty success as local eateries competed to create the tastiest burger and sell as many of them as possible. Two dollars from each burger sold went to the United Way's food initiatives for people in need. The final results were announced this morning. Raising an incredible $23,118. Isn't that amazing? That's the most the campaign has ever raised in a single November. After more than 11,500 burgers were sold last month, the Prospector Burger Barn once again sold the most November burgers with a record of just over 3,100. And Beefcake's Burger Factory won the prize for best November burger for the third year in a row. United Way CEO Albert Brule is grateful for the success of the campaign and how it's grown over the last four years. The need for food has risen dramatically. So our ability to dedicate these funds from Novemberger to support essential food programs uh, will make a difference. Obviously, this is just one of many ways in which the United Way invites community, businesses, individuals, families to get involved and to be supportive, and it's a chance uh, for people to show their local love. A huge part of Beefcakes is trying to give back to the community, Thunder Bay. We're completely Thunder Bay built, um, and we like to give back as much as humanly possible. And Novemberger is always a great way to kind of just punch that point home a little bit more. And so we really, really like to make sure that we try and sell as many as humanly possible so that we can make a big fat check to them. So, The Novemberger campaign is expected to take place again next November for the fifth year in a row. A couple of exciting evenings are coming up at the Thunder Bay Community Auditorium. All the Days Productions is putting on two performances of Annie Jr. The show is very similar to the classic musical, but features more than 50 local actors, dancers and singers, all between 7 to 18 years old. And there's two chances to catch the musical, with shows tomorrow evening and on Monday at 7.30. Director Marcia Arpin says the musical captures the spirit of the season with a little something for everyone. Thrilled to bring back a family classic, and it actually has a Christmas tone to it too. So it's a great way not only to bring the children back to stage, but also to celebrate uh, the holidays with a family-friendly um, performance. This one's kind of special because it's the youngest cast that we've ever had. And so it's really cool to see kind of the younger generation get to do what I've been doing for so long and what I love so much. It's like, it's a really cool experience because you get to hang out with um, the older cast and the younger cast and it's really cool to see how they work differently. Tickets for Annie Jr. can be purchased on the auditorium website. There's just over two weeks until Santa Claus comes to town, and the Christmas spirit was on full display last night on Frederica Street as West Fort Wonderland brought the whole neighborhood together. Hundreds of people took advantage of the mild temperatures and hit the street to take in all that the holiday festival had to offer. That included sleigh rides, hot apple cider, and for the little ones, old St. Nick was on hand to hear all their Christmas wishes. Given that this was the West Fort Wonderland's first year, organizer Mark Nowak was blown away by the turnout. We, we knew we'd get a fair, uh, fairly decent crowd, but we're completely overwhelmed with the number of people that are here. I mean, it's, uh, we're not even an hour into it and the street's full and kids are enjoying themselves, parents are having fun, it's perfect. We're very proud of the fact that we can bring the community together at different times of the year to, to kind of celebrate the uniqueness of being West Forters. Well, Fiona, it warmed up just in time for the West Fort Wonderland. Will that continue?
Oh, well, it got even warmer today, that's <laughs> for sure. Uh, after a low of minus 16 and uh, wind chills around minus 19 during the overnight hours, temperatures have been, albeit slowly, rising steadily all day to a high right on the freezing mark under a fair amount of clouds, mostly cloudy or completely cloudy and overcast were the sky conditions today, but winds were very light from the southeast, 9 to 18 kilometers per hour. So uh, when we hit that freezing mark, really no real wind chill to discuss. Everywhere else also saw some warming temperatures uh, to varying degrees. Fort Francis is currently at their high for the day of minus 4. It's been fairly clear today, and wind chills are currently hovering around minus 9. But there is snow on the way, as is the case for Red Lake. Now, uh, they've had some freezing drizzle in the last couple of hours. Uh, it's a little bit of a break right now, just a lot of cloud, but that freezing drizzle is expected to continue for a few more hours. Currently at minus 8, the wind chill is making it feel like minus 16. Uh, eastward, it gets a little cooler. Pick Pickle Lake at minus 12, minus 10, and Armstrong and Greenstone, where they've had light snow pretty much all day. Uh, wind chills are currently hovering at minus 18, but this is an improvement uh, compared to yesterday and continues to see uh, warming temperatures. Marathon currently at minus 6, and Sault Ste. Marie uh, is experiencing mostly clear skies at this time. They topped out at minus 2. They are currently starting to cool down again. They're at minus 4 and a wind chill of about minus 7. Here in the city of Thunder Bay, it's really not going to get a whole lot colder uh, than it is right now. Only a few degrees. Minus 3 is going to be our low tonight under some low cloud. And uh, despite the winds, uh, it's really not going to see much of a wind chill. It might feel like minus 4, minus 4.5. So all in all, not really worth noting. But there is definitely some snow on the way. And with it, a lot of warmer air pushing into the region. And while the snow is going to be brief, the warm-up, that's going to last a while. And I'll have more details later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, we continue to hear all about the health care crisis that's affecting hospitals across this country. And today, premiers renewed their call for more health care funding from Ottawa. We'll have all the details as your Friday news hour continues. Been, uh, running around and, uh, you know, getting run around in circles for for the last four years.